occasion a busload of, of, uh, of uh, white students slipped across the line to engage us in, uh, in football. I played that first round, vicious, vicious games, because it was segregated, and even though they wanted to test us and we test them, there was a lot of animosity there on that football field. A lot of um, bloodletting, a lot of bruises, some vicious, vicious tackling. Anyway, the, uh, the white group won. Then the clarion call went through the black community that our little team had gotten whipped up by these visitors. So the next Saturday, we had some bigger and faster black players out there. And I would move on. And then the next Saturday, it was back and forth. I mean, going back and forth. And then a strange thing happened after about three or four meetings. We actually started learning each other's names and uh, started having respect for each other. And started wondering, what do you do when you're not out here banging heads? And so we became friends. I became friends with the leader of the other group who uh, was the son of some physician. It was great. Until the next day, when the police showed up. The police showed up uh, quite unkind to the idea that we had taken upon ourselves to integrate this football game. And they didn't talk to us nicely. Oh, their helmets on, their blackjacks out, and they ran on the school campus and they started waving and hitting. I thought they were just going to attack us. They attacked the white students even more nastily than they attacked us. They beat them up. In fact, my friend who uh, follows a physician had his uh, jaw broken in two places. And the uh, policeman told them that they ever caught him up there again, what they would do to them. That brought home another point to me. That segregation just doesn't hurt those of us of color. It hurts those of us who would fraternize with those of color. So it hurt all of us. I think the opportunity for people to go to school together uh, has, has overcome so much, so many of these, uh, of these stereotypes. My wife and I have three daughters. Let me tell you a personal story. Uh, the desegregation of the Jackson Public Schools occurred when they were in elementary, junior high, high school. This was a massive desegregation. And so our daughters found themselves being bused across town to previously all black schools and taught uh, by black teachers. And so many of their counterparts opted out and went to the newly contrived private schools to avoid that unfortunate association. Let me tell you something. These three daughters of ours, who really, really were pioneers as far as school integration was concerned, they benefited so much from those early associations with people of a different race that they would not have had had they not gone to school with. And I hope I'm not stepping on anybody's toes here this morning, but so many kids come out of an all-white private school, and they're totally segregated. And then they go, to, they go to an integrated state university and they're uncomfortable and they separate themselves. In the South, there's a lot of self-segregation. Uh, self when I walk through the law school mall or through the student union on the campus at Ole Miss, I see white people sitting together and black people sitting together and there's no one making us do that. It's a choice that these students have made. It's undeniable. You can look around you and see it. There is a definite tendency to self-segregate. And I do think that it's a positive thing to be around people who are diverse from you, but then to what extent should you force that upon people? You don't want to integrate, then we can all just go and create private schools and live in our own bubbles, you know? Yes, yeah, so I do think that it should be forced. As soon as 
a black family moves into your neighborhood, statistically speaking, the, the value of your property goes down. Whites don't want to live together with blacks, and I just think that is so terrible, you know? Like, if we can work together, if we can go to school together, if we can even go to church together, you know, we should be able to live together. Are we reconciled after segregation and, you know, and people still don't want to live in the same neighborhood with each other? People still don't want to send their children to the same schools? I mean, how many counties in Mississippi, uh, you know, have the white private school and the black public school? In Macon, Mississippi, there is a private academy that's 99.9% .9 white and the public school is 99.9% .9 black. And listen to this, that's not the problem. The problem is the public school is the worst public school in the state of Mississippi. There's no easy answers ever, hey, to things. Yeah. And that's what I've really realized. Mississippi felt a lot like South Africa. And as I said, there's a lot of hope in, 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 in Mississippi. I feel that it can get way better and it will get better. But uh, the only issue down south is, is that people are not uh, talking about the, the real issues openly. It's a necessary thing to talk, you know, as conflicting parties and, you know, come out with all the facts, you know, be honest. You know, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Doesn't matter how much uh, pain and hurt and anguish that causes, that's part of the process. We start at the bottom and we, we grow together, we heal together and we become a nation together. Traveling to the Delta, the students study one means of reconciliation in Mississippi and learn why it's called the Bible Belt. Um, one idea is is the importance of blues in the Southern culture and in reconciliation. And, and the blues are widely recognized as, as critical to the process. And I, I don't think I ever realized before the, the role that blues music has played and just how influential and critical that it was. Um, but also, it can be considered that a creative expression. It can help people find meaning in the things that they've been experiencing. I think that's something we saw in the Delta is that um, a lot of the reconciliation and the positive effects that came out of the, uh, the blues, the music and the culture that evolved around that. Yeah, the thing is you build up a, an opinion about a place before you go there and I suppose you have got these, these inbuilt prejudices and stereotypes that you're just ready to activate the moment that you um, step off the plane. And um, as far as the Delta went, yeah, there was something, I mean, they talk about Mississippi as being one of the Bible Belt states. I was quite surprised at the dominance of religion um, in the states and the amount of religion that we got exposed to and how it seems to be pervasive in all realms, political, social, um, even economic to a certain degree. That was, that was a, a surprise. I didn't think it was that intense. I've learned to be a bit more tolerant myself. Maybe when I was in Mississippi, uh, I tended to view things because in my society in Northern Ireland, religious has been a very divisive thing that's pulled us apart. And in Mississippi, it seems to be a very inclusive thing that has helped the community in many ways. And at first I was a little bit judgmental about that because I was viewing it from a, uh, a Northern Ireland perspective rather than from the Mississippi perspective. So I suppose I've learned to um, take the local context into it and not just view it through my, with my own prejudices. Uh, I think a, a great experience for me was having the opportunity to meet Sala, who is a Muslim, who is quite unlike me, you know, and, and as far as her background, she grew up in Tunisia, I grew up in Mississippi, um, she grew up reading the Quran, I grew up reading the Bible. I mean, you need to be exposed to such different opinions, you know, to make you strike a balance and not really see your own opinion as the sole truth. I'm from South Africa, and South Africa is this part here, at the tip of Africa. And uh, we have 11 official languages, 
we've got Zulu, Sutu, Benda, Sitwana, Debele, Kosa, she's going to help me. Afrikaans. Afrikaans, English. When we watch TV in South Africa, they will portray America as the wonderful country. You never see the other side, that there's still poor people, there's still, they all show all the rich people. But now when we went to Mississippi, Mississippi Delta, it really shocked me that it's still like this. I could just see Africa and any of the, the third world African countries. I mean, this is USA, it's, it's the world power. It's the one giving aid to all these places. It's the one fighting the expensive wars. And now they are a part of the community that are like this, you know, and they've been like that for a very long time. I grew up in Lake Mississippi, so it's, it's very rural. Um, I'm very familiar with the plight of rural black Americans. To some extent, I'm encouraged because I've, I have met quite a few people, uh, blacks and whites, from the Mississippi Delta who have gone on. There are some people who are making it out of this horrible situation. In America, especially in Mississippi, people are doing something for themselves. They trying to work hard. And I, one thing I noticed um, that we have a different definition. We have a different definition of poor compared to America. For somebody in America who is poor, they're able to put food on the table, but they just can't get all the luxury going out. And in South Africa, there are those who go to bed on empty stomachs, kids that are really suffering. I remember we drove through the Delta, and and it was like, hey, this is the poorest people in our, in, you know, in our country. And then the first thing David Miney was like, these people aren't poor. And I was like, you know, yes, they are. It's easy when you're inside America to just look at things from a very American focus. Like, I mean, you, you don't really care what's going on in the outside world because it doesn't affect you. It doesn't have to. To be able to do this is, is not only to go and learn about new places and, and new situations, but it's also to try and thread together the similarities uh, of our, our disparate societies. But it's also to look at my own society, look at Mississippi, through a new lens of, you know, put it in a global context. Many know of the divide between the Irish and Catholic, but the students step further into the troubles and the much deeper history behind them. Hey Vito, I just got to Ireland, here it is, is this for you? <laughs> when we were coming here, I was on the plane with an Irishman, he's 56 years old. He said to me he grew up in Ireland, but still doesn't understand. I was watching the news the other day, one of the guys spoke of politics, and the other one said, no, it's religious. The other one said, it's, it's complicated, I still don't understand it. If you follow the international media, they basically played it off as a Catholic Protestant thing, but it's clearly a much far more complex uh, conflict than I ever imagined. And where religion comes into it is that, by and large, the unionist community would, by and large, be Protestant. Uh, and they want to continue a relationship with England, with Britain as such. Uh, nationalists, of course, want to see a united Ireland, and they are largely, but not exclusively, Catholic. And there's a good deal of secularism now, anyway, coming through, as, as, as is the case internationally. Uh, the major parties are split along sectarian lines. Um, so religion does continue to be a problem here, but I think in the fact that people need to re-educate in that originally the problem here was nothing about religion. It was about political rights for a section of the community which happened to be Roman Catholics, who happened to see themselves as Irish citizens rather than British citizens. Um, and I think the whole re-education needs to go on with regards to the young, that, Prior to 1969, prior to the start of the Troubles, there was a degree of mixing between the, uh, the, the Protestant and the Roman Catholic community. They did live relatively close. There were amount of integrated schools and the separate ghettos, the, separate, the split up of the working class communities into religiously divided communities happened during the Troubles. It wasn't always that way and it doesn't always have to be that way. And one of the main architects of bringing peace uh, to this 
small six county country in the western, <laughs> northwestern part of, uh, of Europe has been John Hume. Well, when we had our major civil rights movement that I was heavily involved in, I was involved in starting a civil rights movement here because we had serious injustice in Northern Ireland. And this city was the worst example of the injustice because although the unionist people, that those who wanted to link with Britain were only a third of the population, they governed the city. They had a system. The city was divided into three voting districts. And two of the voting districts in which the unionists were, the unionists with Britain, elected six each. And the third district, which 70% of the population lived, they elected uh, eight. So they were beaten in every election 12 8, even though they were at 70% of the population. And uh, that, that's, that, this was a gerrymandered city, and it was the worst example of it. And that's where the civil rights movement started here uh, to, to create equality of treatment. And of course, we were heavily inspired at that time by the civil rights movement in the United States. In Northern Ireland, religion is portrayed as <clears throat> the main issue, but it's not really religion which is the cause of the conflict, because the main cause, the main reason for the conflict is political control as well. We're going to the Orange Order Parade, also known as Orange Fest. <laughs> Orange Fest. The reason for the parade, mm -hmm. it's celebrating the 12th of July, which is the day many years ago when um, King William of Orange defeated the Catholic King James at the Battle of the Boyne. Can you tell us a little bit about the order? Well, basically, it was formed um, in the um, in the, in the 17th century, and it um, was following, following the, the, the Battle of the Boyne in 1690 um, that uh, basically set the, the pattern for history in this part of Europe, because many people think it was just something that happened in Ireland, but it was part of a wider European power play between the different kings who were trying to vie for territory. But it's also um, a, a historical thing, it's displaying uh, loyalty, it's displaying obviously the order exists um, to uh, promote faith and, and um, obviously these, all of these things are celebrated at this time of year. In talking to Lee, who has been such a val valuable asset to all of us while we're here and really explaining this stuff to us, he, he put these groups into terms of the American Civil Rights Movement, which is not complete, probably completely accurate, but it is very helpful in understanding um, that a lot of the bands that we saw yesterday, though extremely entertaining and fascinating to watch, um, could maybe be compared to the Ku Klux Klan of the American South, in that they were uh, maybe the working class enforcers of civil rights troubles. In 19th century Ireland, um, when you got uh, Republican, um, Irish Republican elements organizing, um, the Orange Order sort of became a, a bulwark against that. But up until that point, it, it, it was a different um, thing altogether. Whereas from that point on, when they tried to separate this part of the United Kingdom from the rest of it, then the Orange Order be became part of the defense of the United Kingdom at that particular stage. So, um, after our 30 odd years of troubles um, in the last 35 years, the order was obviously seen as defending the, Uni Un the Union. The blatant celebration of, of events that will, that is basically to the detriment of another group. You're celebrating the demise of another, of another group proudly parading through the streets, these underlying meanings. And uh, they come out in their masses. Um, I'm talking about the Orange Order now. If you really want to get along as a nation, you obviously realize that these are sensitive issues. Um, and these are the, the, the kind of things that will perpetuate the divide between two conflicting groups. So it's a bit bleak. I mean, there was an atmosphere of tension, and um, it, it wasn't 
being at that Orange Order Parade, I mean, I had a good time. It was interesting to watch, but it didn't make me want to go back. And as they were marching by, and as I saw small children waving flags, um, it was quite a bit to take in all at once. But as I got away, I started to realize that even children can be the casualties of our own era.